the Arahusa Claus. Da 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 it's our refusers. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't resist. I don't know why, but every time I look at these ships, I think of The Simpsons. I do. It's it's a strange world we live in, but these ships, every time I look at them, they remind me of The Simpsons. For some reason, I look at these ships and I immediately see Bart Skateboard racing down the street and jumping across the wall. I just do. They're in turn oil powered, turbine powered super cruisers. They're super light cruisers or super light super light cruisers or well you other side for yourself. Because they're all about the information battle. And the denial of information. And that's the thing you have to look at these ships and see because the Arafusers are special. And they, of course, then get succeeded by the C-Class, which then gets succeeded by the D-Class, which then get the E-Class. And so these, more than pretty much any other class of cruiser, are where the Royal Navy's interwar cruisers, and they're, therefore their World War II cruisers, come from. They really do. And they're cute, okay? I know I say this about a lot of ships, but these are really are some of the cute little ships. The fact that their stacks do look like some sort of version of Morse code just adds to the cuteness. You know, you have beep, dash, beep. <sighs> they're good. So, scout cruisers. Well, this is where they came from. But finally, it, and this disturbingly enough did take till 1911 when they start looking at them. 1912, they start building them. 1913, they're launched. Woohoo! Hence, 1913 is the year we give. The Royal Navy is building oil fired, turbine powered cruisers. And the thing is, the smaller the cruiser, the more important the speed is to its survival. So the fact that the scout cruisers up until this point have been woefully underpowered, woefully under speed, is all entirely on the Royal Navy. I know I've said many times they go through a difficult period in the 1860s. They do. It's traumatic for everyone, especially the historians who have to read about it. But the fact is, it does have some longer lasting legacies. These ships get built. Well, yeah. This, of course, is not an Arafusa class. You can tell because it has four stacks instead of three. The Arafusers are originally aimed for a, a top speed of 30 knots. This is to allow them to lead destroyers in combat. They don't actually get that. They get 28 and a half knots, but let's be honest, for a final first attempt, it's pretty darn good. Just in the nicest way, you've been building these ships since... X year, you've built Dreadnought battleships which are faster than the scout cruisers you have. At a certain point, someone should have been looking and going, We're doing something wrong here. The main thing, though, the difference is that's coming about is that the Royal Navy is starting to think about the reconnaissance war not just on a strategic level but on a tactical level. And this matters. 
Because when you're thinking about a strategic information war and you're about thinking, well, we might be fighting here, might be fighting there, might be fighting there, you will have more time. Because if you're fighting in Europe, in the North Sea, well, that's very close and therefore everything is going to be very, very short time frames. But the moment you start thinking, well, if we're fighting in the Atlantic, or we're fighting in the ocean, or fighting in the Pacific, it's a long way from home. It's going to take a while for the fleet to get out there. We could pulse some of these cruisers out there, which means they would get a time advantage, which would make up for their speed disadvantage. We could do this. We could do this. The ships carried about 850 tons of fuel oil. This gave them a range of roughly five, mm, well, the ships which had cruising turbines, which were about half of them, had a range of 5,000 nautical miles with us. For those who just had high speed turbines, they got 3,200 nautical miles. This is at 16 knots, so this is why there's no range given here, because some ships are built without cruising turbines, and some with. And this is a good example of technology and how it's evolving. This is a class, we are talking about, of eight ships. And yet, four of them have the ability to cruise for 5,000 nautical miles because they've had cruising turbines implemented into their design. And four of them can only do 3,200 nautical miles because they only have the less efficient at low speed, high speed turbines. <sighs> the world is a cruel, cruel place. <sighs> Three and a half thousand tons at fully loaded. Length, mm, well, overall 132.9 meters, that's 436 feet. But between the perpendiculars, 410 feet, or 125 metres. Beam, 39 foot, or 11.9 metres. Draft, 15 foot, 7 inches, that's 4.75 metres. Mean deep load. That means, realistically, please don't go anywhere shallower than 5 metres depth, because you might hit something, and preferably make sure you've got about six meters so you have a meter's clearance at all times. Please. Please. Pretty please. We beg you. Pretty please. Chief Constructor going, please. Please. Operators, please. Chief Engineer going, I have a very large spanner. Do what he's begging you. I don't beg. I just have the large spanner and the rings of an admiral. And honestly, he gave them to me willingly. <laughs> uh, eight Yarrow boilers. Now, does this mean boilers built by Yarrows? This means Yarrow type boilers. And all of them had the same. And honestly, most of them were actually built by Yarrows, but. Well, some. Let's be doing the vessels built by Vickers and. Beardmore, probably. That's put this way. They maybe got Yarrow boilers. They possibly didn't. They got Yarrow type boilers, definitely. Yarrow made boilers. Mm, we can make better ones than them. And it is some of the interesting things that sometimes some of the best Yarrow boilers came from Beardmore. Beardmore's own design boilers. Do not you do not want. You do not want Beardmore's own design boilers. They are always. How to put this? Beardmore boilers are usually very, very good. But they also require a lot of TLC. Now, that is tools, lubricant, and cuts. The cuts are to you. It, they will make you bleed trying to keep them work. That was you thinking I was meaning tender loving care. Why? It's TLC. 
tools, lubricants, and cuts. Anyway. Bimble's own engine designs? Interesting. And thankfully, after a while, they do really sort of stop trying to push them on their boilers on anyone. But um, they are very good at building other people's pattern boilers. They build them very exactly. And so a Yarrow style boiler built by Beardmores will actually usually be a very good in a boiler. Theoretically 40,000 shaft horsepower deployed by four steam turbine or sometimes in the case of them, some of them four steam turbine sets because they had a cruising turbine and a speed turbine across four shafts for a top speed of 28 and a half knots. Cruising speed, as I mentioned earlier, a paltry 16 knots. Terrible. Complement, roughly 270. Roughly. Roughly. Armament, two single, BL 6 inch, 152mm. Mark 12 guns, to go boom boom at other light cruisers. Six single, quick firing, 4 inch, Mark 5 guns, to go boom 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 at multiple destroyers, and one single quick-firing 3-pounder, 47mm, anti-aircraft gun. To go. Is that an aircraft or a funny-looking seagull? Who cares? Fire just in case. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, it looks like the captain's got seagull for dinner. It's always good to feed the captain well. Four 21 inch torpedo tubes in two twin mounts. Mm, that's to make the point to anything bigger and also so that they can really lead their destroyers into combat. Wardline belt, one to three inches. And a deck, a full one inch deck. Looks nice to have some protection. Our refuser was built by Chatham Dockyard, laid down 28th of October 1912, launched 25th of October 1913, and completed August 1914. Aurora, built by Devonport Dockyard, laid down 24th of October 1912, launched 30th of September 1913, and completed September 1914. And I do hope you like... Please do... This is an extra question. Please consider the Crazy class and the Our refusers, and the different ways I have structured these lists. I'd like to hear which one you preferred. Whether you like the table style I did for the Crazy, or the list style I've done for the Air Refusers. And I have to admit, I noticed it because different people have done different styles in various things, and I thought, hmm, well, I will see whether this different style work, or people like this style or the other style, which one's better for them. Galatea, built by William Beardmore and Company, Dalmuir, laid down 9th of January 1913, launched 14th of May 1914, and completed December 1914. Inconstant, built by Beardmore, laid down 3rd of April 1913, launched 6th of July 1914, and completed January 1915. Penelope. Okay, look. I will tell you now, before we even get into it, there is one name which automatically, if you give a Royal Navy warship, automatically means it will have a tumultuous life. Penelope. Look them up if you want in the Guide to Royal Navy Warship Names, which I think I've got somewhere around here. I'm sure I have that big, I have multiple copies of that big book. I have the new version, the old version, and the prescribed version. And, um, yes, somewhere around here I do have it. Probably staring at me right now. And it will tell you that the Royal, uh, if you look up the careers of any ship named Penelope, they have been storied. Not always storied for a good reason, but they're definitely stories. And there are many sailors' tales about serving on a ship named Penelope. And how the penny was sometimes good, and the penny always came back. But there again, it's supposed to be a bad penny that always comes back. Basically, Penelopes are like war spites, but unlike war spites with their propensity for going off and randomly engaging the enemy, Penelopes have a random uh, randomness for coming back with half the enemy on board them and going innocently, what? 
we stole? Uh, you suggesting we stole something? No! No! These are just trinkets we picked up in our travels. Um, Phaeton, built by Vickers, laid down 12th of March 1913, launched 21st of October 1914, and completed February 1915. Royalist, built by Beardmore again, laid down 3rd of June 1913, launched 14th of January 1915, and completed March 1915. Undaunted, built by Fairfield Shipbuilding and Engineering Company, Govan. Mm hmm. Laid down 21st of December 1912, launched 20th of April 1914, and completed August 1914. <sighs> I love these ships. They are cute. They are really cute. Hmm. Oh. you, Susa. Adathusia. What does she get up to in her career? Well, she has a very simple career, really. After being, she's commissioned in August 1914, she's commissioned straight away to be a flotilla leader for the Harwich Force. On the 28th of August 1914, this is... While she's been in service less than a month, she took a fort at the Battle of Heligan Blight as the flagship of Commodore Reginald Twirt. This is not going to end well, is it? She was damaged by the German cruisers SMS Franlob and Stettin and had to be towed home. If I remember correctly, from the, uh, the uh, Cressy class vessel gave her a tow all the way home. Please go watch that video to find out more about that. And on the 20th of December, she therefore took part in the Croxhaven Raid, after being repaired. 24th of January 1915, she fought at the Battle of Dogger Bank. She then transferred to the 5th Light Cruiser Squadron of the Howitch Force. And in September 1915, she captured four trawlers. On the 11th of February 1916, our refuser, a vessel which had already by this point fought in... Well, how do you put this? Noteworthy events. Battle of Heligan Blight? Mm-hmm. Cookshaven Raid? Dogger Bank? Okay. Fairly well. She's in taking part in the second Battle of Dogger Bank in February 1916, when she strikes a mine off Felixstowe. Drifted onto a shoal while under tow, broke her back. Interesting enough, during the Battle of Heligan Blight, she actually rescues quite a lot of German sailors from ships she sunk. So she's damaged, but yeah. Heligan Blight is not a good battle for the Germans or for anyone, really, who's... Mm, well, honestly, it could have been a lot worse for the Germans. If 7th Cruiser Squadron had arrived, it would have been a lot worse. But that's poor our fuser. Aurora! Sorry. Of course, goes on to become HMCS Aurora. I expect to be getting some comments about the Canadian propensity for not maintaining their ships at some point in this uh, this discussion. And it's rare that a ship gets taken care of by the Canadian government. The Canadian Navy does their utmost. Please note, I'm not so critiquing the Canadian Navy. Their sailors will bend over backwards, will be scrimping, saving, and putting their own money to try and keep their ships going. Governments mm, have a less store a less positive career. Aurora was also commissioned, like I refuse, straight into the Harwich Force. She was leader of First Destroyer Flotilla, and in December 1914 was part of the force that was trying to intercept Hipper's for uh, Hipper's raiding of the East Coast. The flotilla was, though, prevented from in engaging and intervening because they had such poor weather they could barely get out or get moving and to return to Yarmouth. In January 1915, German command ordered a reconnaissance of Dogger Bank by Hipper. He took with him three battle cruisers, one armour cruiser, <clears throat> a very interesting vessel, uh, four light cruisers and 19 destroyers. This message was, unsurprisingly, intercepted by the Admiralty. Hmm. 
And Turret's Force was, of course, part of the groups deployed to for the coming battle. And let's be honest, if Turret had been in charge of the overall force instead of David Beatty, we could have had a very interestingly different battle, because Turret's commands never managed to muck up their signals quite like Beatty managed to muck up his. Aurora departed after their commander. Turret had already left. Basically, Turret was... Ba it was there the enemy are coming. I will go! Ship's going, we're not quite ready. We're not quite fueled. I will go with what I have. Come join me. But shouldn't you be waiting for... I'm gone. Field the ship as quickly as you can. Why? If the Commodore ends up fighting the entire German fleet alone, imagine what we will look like. Yes, sir. Now, uh, in the morning of, well, the 24th of January, uh, Aurora and the majority of Twit Turret's force was mm, 12 nautical miles astern of Turret and David Beatty. However, they managed to encounter good old Hipper at 7.05 a.m. With Aurora spotting a free final cruiser and four destroyers on the horizon. Ah, yes. Aurora decides that what she should do is close to 8,000 yards and challenge the ship. Of course, believing it to be Tirith's own flagship Arafusa, her sister. But um, also surprisingly having all her guns ready. Now let's explain what happens next. The SMS Kohlberg, which of course was a German cruiser, opened fire on Aurora in response. She hit the ship three times. Um, Aurora returned fire dramatically quickly for a ship which is supposedly just going to innocently check it's their commander's ship. Sent a signal to the fleet that she was in battle. Again, amazing how a light cruiser can do that better than the entire battle cruiser fleet in Jutland. I, I, I don't know. It's amazing. It's just, just look at this ship. You know, it, it, just, it just screams mobile communications facility, doesn't it, to you? There is going to be a lot of sarcasm in this entire video. I, I give I give you that warning now. This is a class which brings out the sarcasm in me. Aurora kept on firing. And kept on firing. And the light cruiser all kept on firing. In fact... If we look at the Battle of Durga Bank and what happens there, and we ignore the battle cruisers and what they get up to, it turns into an even worse battle for the Germans. Mainly because, at a certain point, Tirith has stopped taking any notice of BT's commands in any way, and Tirith's own force is now, by that point, is acting in the spirit of what they feel Tirith would want them to do, rather than any instructions which are actually coming out from any radio net that they are bothering to pay any attention to. It's, it's a case of, we have a command structure. We will choose when we pay attention to it. And as we know full well, full well, full and well, our senior officer will quite happily take the political flack from anyone who's upset with us for us not paying attention to their orders, as long as we do what he requests of us, which is fire as many shells and torpedoes into the enemy as we physically can until they either look like a pepper jack or a sunk. After the battle, the light cruisers tried to assist um, the crews of sunken German vessels. They come, it came under air attack, and the rescue efforts were cancelled. Sorry, Galatea. 
because I've got more time to go on Aurora. This is the trouble. I timed this all, and then I just realized that our fuse is going to be so short compared to the rest. She was then assigned to, in February 1915, to 10th Destroyer Flotilla, which was guarding, of course, the eastern approaches. And while she was with this unit, she actually got a flying off platform on a forecastle, a forecastle allowing her to launch a monoplane. The idea was this could, aircraft could be sent up to counter the Zeppelin. Because these kept harassing the Harwich Force. Mm, the aircraft actually proved unsuccessful. Not for stint of trying, and even at one point trying to fire directly up like that. We'll leave that to one side. Um, and so it was uninstalled in August. She left 10th Destroyer Flotilla in June, joining 5th Light Cruiser Squadron. She remained with them till the end of the war. She also had her 3 pounder gun replaced with a quick-firing 3-inch gun um, on the centre line aft to provide the air defence. In August 1915, she took part in the sinking of the Meteor, a German raider. And in October... Hmm, well, she went on other patrols. Did some uh, more uh, and captured a couple of naval trawlers. In March 1916, she covered a seaplane raid off on Haya. In May 1917, she was fitted with chutes and rails for naval mines, which went, of course, over CERN, carrying 74, and managed to lay 212 missions. Which, if it doesn't add up as a complete lay of 74 mines per mission, don't worry, you're not the only one who's thinking that that means it was 2 of 71 and 1 of 70. Rather than, well, 3 of 74 would equal 222. In 1917, she had her pole foremast replaced with a tripod to carry a light director, and her torpedo armament was um, augmented by a pair of tubes being placed on the upper deck in front of the 6-inch gun. Thankfully, at some point, someone went, oh, golly, golly, that's um, not really sensible. And so they removed the head of the other torpedo tubes. For some reason, someone had thought that putting the torpedo tubes ahead of the six-inch gun forward was sensible. But thankfully, they managed to revise that. In March 1918, she was assigned to the 7th Flight Cruiser Squadron of the Grand Fleet. And therefore, she's one of the vessels present at the surrender of the German High Seas Fleet. Between 1918 and 1920, she is decommissioned because the Royal Navy is under financial pressures due to the decommissioning and post-war sorting out of stuff. In March 1920, the Canadian government accepted the British offer of one light cruiser and two destroyers to replace the two decrepit cruisers currently owned by Canada at the time. It's, it's supposed to be roughly three minutes, and I have gone well over on Aurora, but I think she deserves it, so I'm going it. Uh, originally, a Bristol-class cruiser, which was, of course, a coal-fired, was offered. How? And the Canadian government didn't want that. They wanted oil-fired. So Aurora was reactivated, outfitted to, uh, to for a transfer role in the Canadian Navy, and... Well... It was mm, roughly $30,000 at the time, which is a lot, but 10495 was the stuff which didn't include machinery and refrigeration plants, which had to be fixed up. <laughs> After some time in the Canadian government dockyard, she, along with the two destroyers, which were also transferred with her, was sent out for a training cruise via the Caribbean to Eskimo, British Columbia. Um, basically, the mission had two faults. One, it was to cut uh, to sail a long way and show they could sell it, but also it was to drop off secret documents from the Admiralty to British consulates throughout Central and North America. Basically, they'd call and they'd drop off things and make nice. And the squadron was ordered to Pitaneris, Costa Rica, where their presence was used to strengthen the Canadian government's position in negotiations over oil concessions as well along the way. Aurora returned to Halifax in July 1921 via the same route. In August, 
1921. The Canadian Navy did their usual trick. Well, the Canadian government did their usual trick of um, drastic budget cuts. She was paid off in July 1922 and disarmed. Her weapons being placed ashore in training facilities and other more active ships. Her crew was reduced to non manned Much of her up-to-date equipment was salvaged for use in other Canadian warships. And her hulk was left alongside uh, a jetty for the Canadian base in Halifax until 1927. When her deteriorated state resulted in the city officials demanding the Navy move her. She was sold for scrap in 1927 and broken up. Do you realise how difficult it is to make a ship which is... Let's be honest, in 1927 she sold for scrap. So, she is 14 years old in ship age. 14 years old. In fact, she launched in September 1913. She sold for scrap in August 1927. She's not even had her 14th birthday. And she's reached the point to which she's got to be scrapped because she's so terrible that civilians are complaining about what bad a state she is. We're not talking about the Navy. We're talking civilian government. Civilian local government has noticed how bad a state that ship is in. I am a former local borough councillor. I love local governments. But if it's not in their area of expertise, they will take a forever to notice there is a problem. So in the nicest way, how bad has that ship got that the local government have not only noticed about it, but managed to complain in such a way that the central government has actually heard them? Which means it's not the first complaint that's gone to the central government. It's not even the second. It's probably the third, fourth or fifth. Oh, Galatea. Galatea. On commissioning, she was assigned as leader to the 2nd Destroyer Flotilla of Harwich Force. It does seem to be a common theme depending on where this class ends up. Almost as if Turret had some magical effect on the Admiralty to go, I want the sexy new light cruisers. They're all for me. Me. Not sure how he's doing it, but he's doing well. Uh, guarding the approach to the English Channel. Uh, she took part in the shooting down of Zeppelin L-17 on May 1916. And at Jutland, she was the flagship of the 1st Light Cruiser Squadron under the command of Commodore E.S. Alexander Sinclair. Who goes on, of course, to become a full admiral in the Royal Navy and is noted for firing the first shots at the Battle of Jutland. Yes, his squadron fired the first shots. And she was actually the first vessel to report the presence of the German ships, which triggered the battle. She was also the first to receive a hit by the German light cruiser SMS Elbing, uh, but that hit caused no explosions. She sold for scrap in 25th October 1921 because of Royal Navy budget cuts. And Mount Galatea in Alberta is named after this ship. Worthy of a ship being named after her. Uh, well, the worthy of a mountain and being named after her, the, the ship. Would have been nice to have had her around for a bit longer. Ah, uh, inconstant. She took part in the Battle of Jutland. She had most of her, spent most of her time with First Light Cruiser Squadron. On being commissioned, she's assigned to them with the Grand Fleet. And she pretty much spends most of her war with them. She's a useful ship for them. She is one of the vessels which is adapted with the cruising turbine. So she can do the 5,000 nautical miles at 16 knots. Good old beer more. Ah, Penelope. Right then. So. She, as a vessel coming from Vickers, of course, I'm surprised she didn't have a 14-inch gun suddenly appear somewhere on her, but she carried an extra 4-inch anti-aircraft gun in place of two 3-inch anti-aircraft guns, which could be fitted in other, other ships. 
And in August 1915, she's assigned to the 5th Light Cruiser Squadron of the Harwich Force. On the 25th of April 1916, she managed to be damaged by a torpedo from the German submarine UB-29 off the Norfolk coast. She's repaired, and in March 1918 is assigned to the 7th Light Cruiser Squadron of the Grand Fleet. She wasn't sold for scrap till October 1924. She got into some other interesting scrapes, including at one point... The when she was with the Harwich Force, she had a habit of getting very close to the shoreline of the enemy coasts. Um, some of the... How do I put this? Some of the crew felt that their captain believed that his ship was... Um, a, one, a single vessel invasion force. But she did well. She did well. <sighs> Phaeton. Alright, on being commissioned, she was sent to the 4th Light Cruiser Squadron of the Grand Fleet. Between February and March 1915 was operating in the Dardanelles in support of the landings at Gallipoli, and then was assigned to the 1st Light Cruiser Squadron of the Ground Fleet when she returned. By mid-April 1915, she was operating with them, mainly in a scout role and informally often doing personal missions for Jellico when he needed a cruiser to go off and do cruisery things for his own, his own request. So basically, um, let's say your admiral in charge of the Grand Fleet has a suspicion something's going on. They can't mobilise the entire fleet. Because mobilising the entire fleet is expensive and takes time. So they need officers they can trust. The first light cruiser squadron had good officers. HMS Phaeton had a very good captain. Who was trusted. So, push came to shove. I... I Jellico would sort of send off Phaeton to go and find things out. She also took part in the shooting down of Zeppelin L7 in May 1916, and she was part of the Battle of Jutland. She was sold for scrapping in 1923. She was a good little ship. We don't really have a picture of her. She doesn't seem to hang around to be pictured. But, from the left, on this picture, we have Cordella, in constant, and then you have Phaeton. So, theoretically, somewhere around here, you have Phaeton. And then you also have visible Engadine, Vindex, and Galatea. So, well, that's got to be Engadine and Vindex. And that's what's got to be Galatea, so that's got to be Phaeton. Royalist. Ah, Royalist. Basically, she spends her most of her career with either with the 4th Light Cruiser Squadron or the 1st Light Cruiser Squadron as part of the Grand Fleet, as part of their reconnaissance and screening element. And every single battle which the Grand Fleet gets itself involved in, or is coming out for, she's there. But the trouble is with being with the Grand Fleet is you're either going to be in a big battle or you're not. It's not like the Harwich Force cruisers, which will get a battle pretty much every week, because they'll keep running into their equivalent german light forces. When you're part of the battle fleet, the Grand Fleet, you get a battle when there is a grand battle, when there is a big battle. Otherwise, you're not getting it. And then we have Undaunted. Oof. She 
She was assigned, on commissioning, as leader of the third destroyer flotilla of the Harwich Force. You know what's going to happen here. On 24 August 1914, she took part in the Battle of Heligon Blight. On the 17th of October 1914, she takes part in the Battle of Texiel, otherwise known as the Action of 17th of October, uh, with German torpedo boats. This is an action which, frankly, well, how do I put this politely? The Royal Navy turns up with a light cruiser and four destroyers and four torpedo boats. The Ger uh, four, a light cruiser and four destroyers. The Germans turn up with four torpedo boats. The British suffer five wounded and three destroyers likely damaged. The Germans have 218 killed, 31 captured and four torpedo boats sunk. Undaunted, a time battle was armed with a pair of two-pounder anti-aircraft guns. The four Lafore classes, destroyers, with her, were armed with four torpedo tubes in two twin mounts, three four-inch guns, and also a two-pounder gun. The destroyers could make 29 knots. Of course, our, uh, our refuser class, Undaunted, 28 and a half knots. The 7th half of flotilla of the German Navy included the aging Grobs torpedo boat 1898 class boats and they had all been completed in 1904. They were older, they were slower. Well theoretically they were equal speed of 28 knots but the water was not the scenario that torpedo boats are going to be able to go their full speed. They were each armed with three 50mm guns and mm, each vessel carried five 17.7 inch, that's 450 millimeter torpedoes. The British spotted the Germans first. And the Germans seemed to have spotted the British and assumed they were friendly vessels. So the British used that to get closer. German flotilla was part of the Emden Patrol and had been sent out to the Ems River to mine the southern coast of Britain. Including Mouth of Thames. But they were intercepted a long way before reaching their goal. As they managed to get closer and closer, the German vessels finally realised that the vessels they were getting closer to them were British. Undaunted was closest of all to German, uh, Germans, uh, Germans, not the destroyers. Why? Because it was felt that the Arafusers looked enough like their German counterparts that she could pass for it. But the Lafores were definitely not as looking like looking German in style top destroyers. So they were sort of hanging back behind her. She opened fire straight away on the nearest torpedo boat. This vessel managed to dodge the fire from Undaunted by changing course, but as it changed course, it of course lost speed. And, well, at this point, you hear the lessons learned of the 22nd of September 1914, i.e. the experience of what happens when cruisers are unsupported versus torpedo orientated vessels, whether that's submarines or destroyers. Fox, who's in command of the force, orders the squadron to divide. Lance and Lennox chased S-115 and S-119. Legion and Loyal pursued S-117 and S-118. Legion and Loyal and Undaunted damaged S-118 so badly its bridge was blown off the deck and this sunk her at 315, uh, 317 at 15-17 hours. Lance and Lennox engaged S-115 Disabled her steering gear yeah, and caused her to just sit and go around in circles. Um, 
Lennox managed to actually also blow her bridge off, but the German torpedo boat refused to strike its colours. It's lost its entire bridge. It might not have the ability to strike its colours at this point. The two central boats in the German flotilla, S-117 and flotilla leader S-119, tried to attack undaunted with torpedoes, but undaunted outmaneuvered the German boats and remained unscathed. Just sort of sailing around going, Hello, I'm here. Oh, you missed me. Oh, good. Legion and Loyal managed to finish off S-18, and then they came to support Undaunted and engaged the two attackers. Legion taking on S-107, which fired its last three torpedoes and then continued to engage with gunfire. I'm not quite sure why. I don't really think the 50mm have any chance of it doing anything, but there again, the Germans are just as brave as the British, and they're going to go down fighting. They know the odds once they see the scenario. Unfortunately, Legion has a lot more firepower and literally starts to blow the S-117 apart. Quite literally starts to blow it apart. Takes out her steering, the steering mechanism and forces her to circle before she herself is sunk at 15.30 hours. So, we're at the point at which the Germans have lost two already and the battle's been going less than quarter of an hour. At the same time, Lance and Lennox had taken S-105 to the point where only one destroyer was decided it was needed. Basically they had ch chiseled that ship away with that ship. They had chiseled things off. It was a case of a okay, she's still got hull above the waterline so yeah, you stay and finish her off I'll go fight the other one and the other one's going you really didn't need to I, I, I'm I, not sure I need this affection and love um, I don't need this embrace Lance therefore joined Loyal in bombarding S-19 with Lidite shells it's nice to send Lidite shells um, S-19 managed to fire a torpedo at Lance, which did hit Lance amidships, but the torpedo failed to detonate. So Lance was going, yes. And the crew were very happy, because let's be honest, World War I destroyers, torpedo boats, they get hit by a torpedo, just one, they're going sky high. They have no chance. S-119 herself was sunk at 1535 hours by gunfire from Lance and Loyal, uh, which took the German flotilla commander down with it. If he was still alive by that point, the cheat had also been completely... Well, I wouldn't like to say decapitated, but completely swept of anything above deck level by this point. S-115 was still staying afloat, until um, Lennox sent a boarding party. They found a wreck with only one German on board who happily surrendered at this point because, well, she was still afloat, but he didn't really rate his chances of living that long. They eventually managed to rescue 30 members of crew from the sea by the various British vessels. The action ended at... 1630 hours, with Undaunted being called in to finish off the S-115 with her 6-inch guns, because nothing else was making big enough holes. It just wasn't sinking. Summary. So what are these ships? Well, they're light cruisers, aren't they? And they're good light cruisers. They are genesis point for where the British cruisers of World War II will come from, really. 
No, they do not have the twin turret six inches, and yes, they still carry the four inch guns. And yes, they still look very much like cruisers of their era. But when you talk about it in terms of their performance, in terms of their duties, in terms of what missions they undertake and how they perform, This is where the light cruisers the Royal Navy will deploy in World War II draw their breath from. The other thing I'd like to summarize is please, whatever you do, do not give the Canadian government cruisers. I mean, every single cruiser I have looked at that's ever been handed over to the Canadian government seems at some point to end with the Canadian government either ignoring it, decommissioning it, or forgetting they have it, until it's in such a bad state people are literally shouting at them to dispose of it. They are perfectly good at looking after destroyers. I have been around Hyder, I have seen, admittedly there was a lot of people involved in that, and it's now been taken over by the Canadian Parks and as the, the friends of Hydra, etc. So combined together, that's perhaps one reason why Hydra has done so well in surviving. But, I have seen all that. And that was fine. But cruisers, why? Why Canada? Now, there is only one more cruiser video to go in the year of the cruiser videos before we get on to the Christmas specials, which are going to be a lot more cruiser videos as well, but, you know, this is the year of the cruiser. These were the videos which I stretch out, and I, you know, and once the year of the cruiser is up, once the that hipper class video comes out, I will happy with it by that point the year of design and technology, which will be 2023. I'm happy with roughly 25% of the titles so far. So, the question today is going to be slightly different. Normally I do a question around cruisers, but today I'm going to do a question based around the year the year of design technology. In that I have at several points asked what topics would you like to be included? And if you've already commented, that's great. If you have more ideas, please feel free to put them below. If you haven't commented before with ideas of what things you like covered in the year of design technology, please put them below. I would love to see it here what you would like to be covered in next year's videos. And of course, while I'm doing these videos, <sighs> thank you very much for getting me over the 9,000 subscribers mark. That's very kind. But it means, technically at the moment, I'm roughly 970 subscribers away from the point at which, which if I reach by midnight, Christmas Eve, my mum wins the bet with, my, with her sis, twin sister, my aunt, and I no longer have this bet of how many subscribers I've got becoming, being a maternal auntie bet over my head. Because my mum has promised it will not be on this one, this topic again. So, please. <laughs> oh. Please, if you like the videos, please share, please subscribe. Please just make it so that I have a Christmas day which doesn't involve my aunt, you know, and my aunt winding up my mum. It's done in a very funny, a fun family fashion, and it's all done from a loving place. But I just don't want it again. <laughs> oh, right. Thank you very much, everyone. Hope you enjoyed, and take care.